Good afternoon, Mark. We are streaming live. Hello. Yes, Ma. Good afternoon. We are streaming live, Ma. Okay. So start. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. Now today we will be discussing the chapter derivatives. The first thing we need to discuss in this chapter is what is meant by financial analysis. <clears throat> what is financial analysis? Financial analysis, analysis itself is the process of in-depth study of the nature of something in order to determine its essential features and relationship with others. So the idea behind any analysis is studying in depth the nature of something so that you know what are its essential features and what is the relationship with other things which are related. Financial analysis is an in-depth study of the financial statements in order to draw some conclusions. Now from this, you have drawn some conclusion. You need to, let us say there is a financial problem which you are facing. That you need to solve. Financial engineering is the development and application of financial technology to solve financial problems. So we have seen already the basic or primary aim or objective is creation of value. So financial engineering involves creation of value. How do you create value? By identification and exploitation of financial opportunities. Now we know opportunities and problems are closely related. It depends on how we take it. One might look at it as a problem, another might look at it as, a, as an opportunity. If for the problem you are able to find a solution, it becomes an opportunity. <clears throat> so, uh, in fact, uh, you would have heard this, that uh, an optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty and a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. So, opportunity and difficulty or problems are closely related. If you are able to solve the problem, if you are able to overcome the difficulty, it becomes an opportunity. What is financial engineering? Financial engineering aims to create value and enhance wealth. Our objective itself is uh, creating value. That is what we are interested. So what exactly is financial engineering? It is application of financial technology to solve <coughs> financial problems. So it is an interdisciplinary branch. That is, you draw for financial engineering, you draw concepts from various disciplines, applied mathematics, statistics, computer science, financial theory, economics, all that. Our objective 
is in-depth study to identify opportunities and exploit those opportunities to create value. <coughs> so what does a financial engineer do? He focuses on designing, developing and implementing, designing, developing and implementing new products, new processes, innovative solutions, to a financial problem. <coughs> so we have discussed what is financial analysis. We have discussed what is financial engineering. Now we need to discuss what is risk management. <coughs> you have a separate chapter, risk management, chapter two. You also have Another chapter, interest rate risk management. You have yet another chapter, forex exposure and risk management. So we are looking at, see, essentially, we are looking at three things. If we, the entire uh, AFM chapters which you have, if you want to uh, <clears throat> divide it, you can divide it into three broad groups. What are those three things? One is to do with valuation, which we have already seen. Bond valuation, equity valuation, like that. The other is taking decision regarding investment, which we have seen advanced capital budgeting decisions, that is an investment decision. And then uh, portfolio management, mutual fund, mergers and acquisition. Each one of these is an investment decision. The other is what we are discussing just now. That is risk management. <coughs> so what is risk management? Risk management refers to the process employed by a company to manage its risk at an acceptable scale. So risk management means what? First of all, identification of risk. Okay, <laughs> you have identified the risk, then what you should do? Risk measurement. Then what you should do? The risk which you have should be brought to an acceptable level at the least possible cost. That is risk management. So it is a logical development and execution of a process to deal with potential losses. The aim of risk management is to bring what risk, overall risk or specific risk to the desired level. Every entity, every individual, they will have their own acceptable level of risk. So if you are able to bring the risk in that opportunity to an acceptable level at the least possible cost, then that is risk management. So risk management, Looks at three things. One, identification of risk. That is the opportunity. Two, measurement of risk. Because what can be measured can only be managed. If you can't measure something, you can't manage it. Then third, of course, is the risk management part where you bring down the risk to an acceptable level at the least possible cost. Now, derivatives are for risk management. That is why it was necessary for us to first think about uh, or rather discuss about what is financial analysis, financial engineering, and then, of course, risk management. Before we get into derivatives, first of all, we have to be clear about this. That is why we are discussing. 
Now, let us move on to derivatives, which is the topic for today. What is derivatives? Derivatives are financial instruments or contracts whose value name itself tells you. Derivatives are financial instruments or contracts whose value depends upon the value of an underlying derivative it derives its value from an underlying it doesn't have its own independent value what is a derivative derivatives are financial instruments or contracts whose value depends upon the value of an underlying a derivative does not have any value of its own okay so now when we talk about a derivative it is a financial contract between two or more parties that derives its value from an underlying asset or group of assets or a benchmark. The essential feature, it doesn't have any value of its own. It derives its value from an underlying. So the prices of derivatives, how we will get based on the fluctuations in the prices of the underlying. Now, generally, derivatives are leveraged instruments. That is, 100% you need not make an investment. Therefore, as with any leverage instrument, it magnifies the potential risks and rewards. Rewards are also magnified, but we can't just look at the rewards. Risks are also magnified. <coughs> so what do we know now? A derivative is a contract that derives its value from the performance of an underlying asset. It derives its value from the performance of an underlying asset. So change in the price of the derivative is dependent on change or fluctuation in the price of the underlying. Now, derivatives are of predetermined fixed duration. Therefore, on maturity, profit or loss is determined by or is determined based on the price of the underlying on that date. That is how it is determined. So, what do we know now? We know regarding derivatives. A derivative is a contract that derives its value from the performance of an underlying asset. Change in the price of the derivative is dependent on change in the price of the underlying on maturity because it's of a predetermined fixed duration on maturity the profit or loss is determined based on the price of the underlying on that date so what is derivative derivative means forwards futures or options derivatives means forwards Futures or options. They are contracts. Forwards, futures, or option contracts of predetermined fixed duration linked for the purpose of contract fulfillment to the value of specified real or financial asset or to an index security. Now, this is the definition of derivatives given by Dr. L.C. Gupta committee, which was formed for the purpose of introduction of derivatives in our Indian market. This was about three decades ago where this uh, definition of derivatives is given. Derivative means this is the definition given by Dr. L.C. Gupta. Uh, this does not uh, look at swaps. 
SWAFs also are derivatives. But here in this definition, because it is for developing the market, they are having only the definition only mentions about forward futures or options. So according to this committee, derivatives means forward futures or option contracts of predetermined fixed duration of predetermined fixed duration linked for the purpose of contract fulfillment to the predetermined fixed duration. We already saw derivative has a limited life. Predetermined fixed duration linked for the purpose of contract fulfillment to the value of specified real or financial asset or to an index security. <coughs> this is what we mean by derivative. Now, of course, uh, you have uh, FDRA. There also derivative is uh, defined. It is an inclusive definition which says a derivative is a security derived from a debt instrument, share, loan, whether secured or unsecured, risk instrument or contract for differences or of any other uh, form of security. So, a contract which derives its value from the prices or intended prices of the underlying security. That is what your SCRA tells you as to what is a derivative. So, what is it, please? Uh, in the LC Gupta committee, there was a mention only about three types of derivatives, namely forwards, futures, and options. We saw that you have yet another uh, classification of derivatives, which is your swaps. So now, based on the nature of contract, derivatives can be classified as forwards, futures, options, swaps. Based on the nature of the contract, derivative can be forwards, futures, options, swaps. Then, based on the underlying, what is the underlying, the original, or the primary or the real uh, asset upon which the derivative price is based, that can be many things. It can be a commodity, it can be equity, it can be bond, it can be interest rate, it can be index, it can be foreign currency. So the underlying in a derivative contract can be a commodity. It can be a commodity. It can be a commodity like crude oil. It can be an agricultural commodity. It can be a precious metal, anything. Then it can be equity, some equity share. It can be a bond. You can even have interest rates or you could look at an index or you can look at foreign currency. Now, any of these can be an underlying. This is based on the underlying how it can be classified. First, we saw based on the nature of the contract, it can be power features options swaps. Based on the underlying, it can be commodity, equity, bond, interest rate, index, foreign currency. Then, based on how a derivative is traded, based on that also, we can classify. <coughs> you can say that a derivative can be OTC or over the counter and exchange traded. Now, what is the advantage of derivatives means first risk management next income generation supposing see what is it we discussed even before we came to derivatives we discussed about risk management only for risk management to have a solution you need structured or constructed products. That is why we discuss financial engineering. 
Now, financial engineering is the result of financial analysis. That is why we discuss financial analysis. So, what all did we discuss before we came to that? Uh, we discussed about financial analysis. Financial analysis is in depth study of something in order to understand its nature and the interrelationship which it has from with others. Financial analysis means analyzing the financial statements. Okay. You will draw conclusions with financial analysis. After you have drawn conclusions, what should you do? You should look at how to solve this. Supposing you have a problem, you have a difficulty, then we have to see how to overcome that. So that is where financial engineering comes into play, where we have the solution. Now, why are we having this? For risk management. So what are the products we are talking about? We are talking about derivatives. This is the connection between all that we have discussed today. <clears throat> now, what are the advantages of derivatives? First, let us say you are a hedger. Who is a hedger? A hedger is one who wants to take protection. He wants to avoid downside risk. Hedger means he wants to avoid downside risk. Then, this for risk management for hedger, it is useful. <coughs> then, income generation for the arbitrator and speculator, this aids in income generation. Then, when you have derivative products, it helps you in price discovery. Arbitrators play, see, in the market, three parties are involved hedger. Speculator, arbitrator. Hedger is the one who wants to take protection, who wants to manage his risk. Speculator is the one who willingly accepts the risk for a price. Then you have arbitrator. Now, arbitrators are the smartest people around. What they do is they look at price disequilibrium and try to take advantage of that. But a very important role is played by the arbitrator, where the arbitrator <coughs> brings about price disequilibrium. What the arbitrator does is he buys from the cheaper market and supplies in the costlier market. And in this process, in the cheaper market, as he buys, demand goes up. In the costly market, as he supplies, the supply goes up. Therefore, the price is brought to equilibrium. Then, another advantage of derivatives is it is regulated by SETI. So, you can say that you have transaction efficiency. <laughs> and in fact, as I was telling you, the entire uh, discipline or uh, science of financial engineering was uh, there only because of derivatives. So, we said forwards, futures, options, facts. First, let us see what is a forward, what is the future, what is the difference, what is a forward, a forward contract is a bilateral contract, that is two parties are involved, <laughs> in which the buyer and the seller agree upon Delivery of a specified quantity or quality. They agree upon delivery of a specified quantity and quality of an asset on a specified future date at a predetermined price. So, what is the essential idea of a forward? Only the terms are agreed now, actual transaction takes place in future. So, the essential idea of entering into a forward contract is to peg the price, fix the price, and avoid price risk. So, from the discussion which we have had just now, what are all the features of a forward? First, it is a price fixing product. Second, it is an OTC product. Third, it is a customized product. Fourth, there is no liquidity. Fifth, the parties are committed. Sixth, counterparty risk will be there. 
So it is a price fixing product. And <coughs> it is an OTC product. Because it is OTC, it can be customized. Because it is customized, there is no liquidity. The parties are committed. Because the parties are committed, we have counterparty risk. These are the features of OTC. Now, what is a feature? A future contract is a contract in which the buyer and seller agree upon delivery of a specified quantity and quality of an asset on a specified future date at a predetermined price. You know, uh, it is the same uh, forwards definition which I am giving, but finally the difference comes. Exchange. A future contract is also like a forward. There is only one difference. What is the difference? The difference is that in a future contract, the exchange is involved. Forwards are bilateral contracts, futures are exchange traded contracts. We can say the futures are exchange traded versions of OPEX. So now, what do we know? Let us compare. Let us see what are all the features of futures. Price fixing product. Yes. But exchange traded product. Okay. Therefore, standardized product. Okay. Because it is standardized, high liquidity. And both parties are they committed? Yes. But do you have an outer party risk? No. Why don't you have a counterparty risk? Because the exchange is involved and it is going to collect margin money from me. There is no question of a risk, credit risk, default risk, counterparty risk. That is not there. <coughs> Are you clear with this? Then futures, we will have to look at what is known as the concept of margins. You have, see how that in a future, the exchange is able to eliminate counterparty risk. It is able to eliminate counterparty risk only because it is able to collect margin. So we need to understand the concept of margin here. Margin, we have what is known as initial margin. What is an initial margin? An initial margin is the margin which is collected <clears throat> at the time of entering into the contract from both the parties. That is initial margin. <clears throat> so, whoever is involved in futures market, the traders in the futures market, they maintain a margin account. They maintain a margin account with the broker. So initial margin money must be deposited in the margin account at the time of entering into a futures contract. At the time of initiating a futures position, initial margin money is blocked in the account of the buyer as well as the seller. Now, the unique feature about a future contract is that there is what is known as MPM marking to market. At the end of the market session, all outstanding contracts will be repriced at the settlement price of that session. So any gain or loss resulting from repricing would be credited and debited to the margin account. So the value of futures contract, we can look at it as it is set to zero at the end of each trading day. So, any uh, profit or loss will be debited or credited. If you have a loss, your account will be debited. And if I have a uh, profit, my, okay, my account will be credited. Now, there is something called maintenance margin, which is less than the initial margin. And uh, maintenance margin is a margin that has to be maintained at all points of time. If your margin account for falls short of the maintenance margin, a margin call will be made and you will be asked to top it up. 
that is so we know the concept of initial margin and we know the concept of uh, maintenance margin and we have seen what is to be done so let us see So now let us uh, look at a problem on margin account. See what is to be done. So now you have a problem. You are required to determine the daily balance in the margin account and payment of margin calls, if any. So you have index futures, which are traded in multiples of 50. So quotations are given. You have high low closing. Among high low closing, we are interested in taking only closing value. As we already discussed, futures are subject to the settlement process of marketing to market. Because of that, at the end of every trading day, we will see how much is the gain or loss and accordingly adjust that position. So how will we go about doing it? It is stated on four two closing is three two nine six point five. Now he bought an index futures contract. Now, because we say it is a futures contract, it is exchange traded, it is standardized, what will be the lot size? That also will be fixed. So, what do they say? We are looking at the high price, low price, and closing price. There is no indication in the problem as to what price it was bought. So, we will just take the closing price to be the price. Now we know that we need the initial margin and the maintenance margin. Initial margin is a margin that has to be deposited at the time of entering into the contract, both by the buyer and the seller. And maintenance margin is something which is to be maintained at all points of time. And if it's not maintained, a margin call will be made. So I'll give you a couple of minutes for you to try this, then we will discuss. So now, what do we know? If I have to open the margin account, the first thing I need to know is what is the initial margin? Then I need to know what is the maintenance margin? Then I can find out how much is to be deposited initially and what is the amount to be maintained, whether I'm able to get it. 
accepted. Now, you know regarding the normal distribution. Normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve where it is symmetrical. The mean, median, and mode, they are the same. So, if you look at the problem, what does the problem say? The problem says the average daily absolute change in the value of the contract is 10,000. That is, every day, if you look at the change in the price, in the value of the contract, and you average it, it is 10,000. That is what is stated. So, this is the mean. Average daily absolute change is the mean. Standard deviation of change is given. Now we know that for a normal distribution, there are only two parameters. One is your mean, the other is your standard deviation. So if let us say there is the average change is 10,000 and you collect 10,000 as initial margin, it means you will have only 50% confidence level. That is the uh, nature of the normal distribution. Mean, median, more, equal means the center point is also the median is also the mean, which is the average. And also it is the most frequently occurring value. Therefore, in the standard normal distribution, if you see, the distribution is cut into half. And therefore, the middle point, since it's symmetrical, the area would be 0.5. Supposing... See, normally these things, 99% confidence is what will, uh, will be taken. While uh, considering value at risk and collecting the margin, the confidence level that is required would be 99%. Mu plus 1 sigma would give you 84.13% confidence. Plus 2 sigma would give you 97.72 confidence. All this is from the normal distribution table. Let's look at the value. That is what it is. So, is clear? So, I have shown to you. If you take, if you collect mu plus one sigma, eighty-four point one three degree of confidence. If you collect two sigma. How much it is? Three sigma. How much it is? Is this part clear? Ten thousand is given to be the mean. Two thousand is the standard deviation. So, if we want ninety nine percent, it is two point three three. You have to collect, and if you want ninety nine point eight seven, you can collect plus three sigma. This much margin money if you collect, this will be the level of confidence. Is this clear? The values we have taken from the normal distribution table. Is this point understood?
So now, once we know this, let us say we want 99.01% confidence. Then we should be collecting 14,660. Let us say we want 99.87% confidence. Then we, would, we should be collecting 16,000. Assuming that we want 99.87% confidence and we are collecting 16,000 as the initial margin. This is the position. Initial margin is 16,000. Maintenance margin is 72% of that. Therefore, 12,000. Contract size is 50. So now, what should we do? Now, there are certain jargons which will be used. That is, long, short. That is, if you buy, it means you have gone long. If you sell, it means you have gone short. These are uh, terminologies used in the derivative market, especially in futures and options. So here, what does the problem tell us? The problem tells us Abhishek bought one index futures. That is why he said long position. So fourth is when he entered 16,000 he would have deposited. The balance is 16,000. Today, the price, see if you have a long position, and the price drops, there is a loss. If you have a long position and the price goes up, that is a gain. This is for one. Like that for 50 because the contract size is 50. What is the loss? Adjust it. You'll get the margin account balance. Now we already saw 12,000 as the maintenance. So till such time it reaches 12,000, no action will be taken. When it falls below 12,000, there will be a margin call to make good the balance to the initial balance. And it will go on. Is this clear? So what have we done? Initial margin was not given straight away, but mean and standard deviation was given. So with the normal distribution table, standardized normal table, we found for a 99.87% confidence, how much should it be? It should be mu plus 3 sigma. So 10,000 plus 2,000 into 3. 16,000 is what we will collect as the initial margin. And maintenance margin is 75% of that. So how much is the maintenance margin? What is the contract size? There is long position because it is a bought-in position. And whenever you hold a long position, let us say the price drops, then you lose. Let us say the price increases, then you gain. That is the gain or loss for one. But the contract is for 50. It is a standardized contract because we are talking about future. It is 50. So for 50 units, what will be the gain or loss? Adjust the gain or loss in the margin account balance. And when the margin account falls short of the maintenance balance, which is the margin balance that has to be maintained at all points of time, make a margin call. The party has to make good that before the Trading starts the next day, and therefore the balance will go up to the initial margin, then continue the same process. The problem is asking you to do it for 10 days, and therefore we can. they have given till 4th to 18th. 
Let us start trading this and the food. In between holidays are that you won't have. You can look at the solution. Once again, I will explain. Ideally, you should be working out and then checking it out so that whether it is clear or not, we will know. What has happened? Initial margin 16,000 was deposited. Okay. The balance in the margin account will be 16,000. Then the next day, the price drops. You have bought it at 3296.5, but today it is only 3294.4. There is a drop means for every unit, 0.1 is the loss. Like that 50 contract size is given to be 50. So 105. From 16,000, reduce that. That is always your balance. But anyway, you won't make a margin call because it has not fallen to maintenance margin. Maintenance margin is the margin which you will have to uh maintain at all points of time so again next day another drop what is the loss next day again it drops what is the loss totally you find that it has dropped 11,790 by adjusting all the losses now this has fallen below 12,000 therefore you make a margin call you have to deposit this money it will come to 16,000 again. You have a profit means it will be added. You have a loss means it will be deducted. This will go on till the last day that they want you to prepare the accounts. This is margin account. The problem itself, they will give you the value. Whether you have to take 3 or 2.33 watt, that will be given in the problem. Now, maybe we can look at one more problem where we ascertain the profit or loss. Hope this is clear. We can move on to the next one. So, in this problem, compute mark to market cash flows, daily closing balances, and net profit or loss for an investor who has taken a long position. Again, for someone who has taken a short position. So, both long position means you have bought it, short position means you have sold it. The price of March infrastructure on a particular day is 9170, trading lot is 50. Initial margin is 8% and maintenance margin is 6%. Like this straight away, they may give the margin also. Then settlement price, the index flows at the following levels on the next five days. That is also given. So now, how to go about doing it?
So now, what is the first thing? Always when we open a margin account, we need to know what is the initial margin, what is the maintenance margin. Now we have the initial margin, we have the maintenance margin. Margin account, what is the position we will see? Long position is what we are looking at because first for someone who has bought it. So what can we do? First initial margin of 36680 has been deposited. What is the price next year? You entered at 9170. You have a long position. That has gone up. You gain. So this is for one for 50. How much? So much account balance. What happens? Then next day again, there is a gain. The account goes up further. But the next day there is a loss. And therefore, that amount will be debited. Still. 27,510 is the maintenance margin. It's not reached that. So much call will be made. Next day, again, a loss is there and it has gone below the uh, maintenance margin. And therefore, what is the margin call to bring it back to the uh, initial margin? Then next day, what happens? Now, the profit or loss which the person has made can be found in three ways. One of it is will be to add the daily gain or loss and arrive at the answer. This is one way of finding it. This is one way. Another way in which we can find this is what is the closing withdrawal balance? That is your money. Opening balance you deposited, less margin call you deposited. Totally now what is available is 45,680, whereas what you've deposited is 47,180, therefore 4,500. Or alternatively, I can simply take the closing settle price, deduct the opening price, get the profit or loss per unit. Multiply with the lot size, get the net profit or loss. That way also I could have found. So one of the three ways I can do. One of the three ways I can find the profit.
So now this is over. If it had been a short position, what would have happened? Now, if it is a short position, if the price goes up, there is a loss. Because you have sold at a lower price, now the price has gone up means the difference is a loss. Then as with the other one, we found the profit or loss per unit, multiply with 50 to get it for our contract, adjust with the margin account balance. The moment the balance drops below the maintenance margin, you need to make a margin call to bring it back to the initial margin. And then again, profit or loss can be found in three different ways. One, the daily profit or loss has to be added, which is what we have seen here. Then again, profit can be found by looking at what is the closing balance, how much did you deposit, margin call, how much you deposited, what is the total cash, net profit or loss. For entry price and closing price difference, if it is a sold position, if the price has come down, there is a profit. So what is the profit? Okay, next, let us move on to the next question. What do we know now? Required the beta of his portfolio. The other day we did portfolio management. We know how to find beta. Theoretical value of futures contract. Now, theoretical value, fair value, intrinsic value, all means we will try to find out what the value should be. That is, we will find the future value. The number of Nifty contracts that he would have to sell if he desires to hedge 150% of the portfolio. So you are given e to the power. Now, whenever we look at uh, compounding, discounting, we can have periodical compounding. Or we can have continuous compounding. In derivative markets, continuous compounding will be used. For continuous compounding, e to the power rt will give us what is the compound factor. That is straight away given in the problem for you. So you can try this. Beta, we know, is the weighted average beta, the individual securities that constitute the portfolio. Now, first, we need to find beta. 
we have been given the number of shares and market price for each of these shares. You multiply, you get the market value. Beta value is given. Use the relative weights. Multiply with the beta for each share. Get the beta value. The security, what is the price? How many shares? What's the market value? So for this market value, what is the weight? Multiply with beta, add. You get the beta. Portfolio beta you have. The fair price or the theoretical price for a future is the future value of spot price. So now, next, once we have found beta, what can we do? Now, current Nifty is given as 9380. Cost of capital, if you look at the problem, Cost of capital is given as 16%. Compounded continuously given. That is why we are taking e to the power rt. Now, what does the problem state? Let us look at the problem once again. Required beta of his portfolio, which we already found. The theoretical value of futures for contracts expiring in September and October. We are looking at September contracts. We are also looking at October contracts. The number of Nifty contracts that we have to sell if he desires to hedge 150% of the portfolio until October. So now, portfolio consists of four securities, AKSP. As we have already seen, market price and number of shares given. Cost of capital is 16% per annum compounded continuously. Kasi fears a fall in the price of shares in future. Accordingly, he approaches you for advice to hedge his portfolio. Following additional information, current Nifty, Nifty futures that uh, lot size is given. Futures for September are currently quoted at 9540. For October, it is quoted at 9820. So how to go about doing the problem? What do we know now? What is the current Nifty value? What is the rate? How many months? Time to expiry. Cost of capital into time to expiry. RT. E to the bar 0 0.08. E to the bar 0 0.08 is straight away given in the problem. So you accept it. Find the theoretical value. This is the theoretical value. The underlying assets spot price and future price will be different because the spot price is the present value of the asset, whereas future price is the future value of the asset.
So September as well as October is asked. When you go to October, e to the power 0 0.093, e to the power RT we need to find. And for 0 0.093, again, straight away the E value is given. We can find the uh, futures theoretical value. Future value is equal to spot into compound factor. Continuous compounding, the factor is e to the power of t. The next one. The question is, the number of Nifty contracts that he would have to sell if he desires to hedge 150% of the portfolio until October. So, what is the market value? What is the portfolio beta? Because we know beta tells me how much this will change for a given change in market. So, the portfolio value to be hedged should be market value of portfolio into beta. That is 100%. You want to hedge 150%. So, what is the portfolio value to be hedged? And the futures price. The problem has mentioned the futures price to be 920 for So, you will take that contract size. What is the contract value? So, how many contracts? These are standardized. You cannot have fractional contracts. You have to round it up. This is done. Okay, this is done. Then we can move on. Now let us see what this problem is about. You are required to determine portfolio beta. Again, same story. Portfolio beta is a weighted average beta of the individual securities that constitute the portfolio where the investment proportion of each security is taken to be its weight. Then the value of risk-free security to be acquired. The number of shares of each company to be disposed of. The number of Nifty contracts to be bought or sold. The value of portfolio beta for 1% price in Nifty. Details about the long-term portfolio of shares of an investor is as under. So KLM, how many shares, what market price, what is the beta? The investor has the opinion that the risk of the above portfolio is very high and wants to reduce his portfolio beta to 0.91. That we will know after we have solved for beta. Two strategies he is considering. He wants to dispose a part of his existing portfolio to acquire the three securities. That is why the question the value of the three securities should be acquired. Then take appropriate position on 50 futures. 
which are currently dead. <clears throat> So, what should be done? The first one is about beta. So now we can check the answer. The first requirement is to find beta. Weight of each security into beta add will give you portfolio beta. Next, see the question is about he is considered uh, actually what is the beta you are having? You are having a beta of 1.3. He is not happy with that. He wants the beta to be only 0.91. So, how to make it 0.91? There are two ways of doing it. One, you can dispose of a part of your portfolio and get. Risk free security. Risk free security means beta is zero. Therefore, you can find out how much is to be bought. That is the first suggestion he has. Equity beta, how much? 1.3. What do you require? 0.91. For risk free securities, what is the beta? Zero. The weight of equity in desired portfolio will be X. Now we are looking at a binomial situation. So the weight of risk free security will be 1.6. 1.3 into x, then 0 into 1 minus x. That should be equal to 0 0.91. Solve for x. So we have assumed x to be equity. 70% balance has to be risk free. Total value we know risk free to be bought This is one strategy. What is the next one? Take appropriate position on Nifty futures, which are currently traded 16 to 50. And the lot size we have is.
Now I have to uh, the previous one is that you have a question. The number of shares of each company to be disposed of for what for acquiring the delivery. How much do you want to acquire? You have decided that you want to acquire 15. 15 crores. So how much you have to dispose of? So everything 30% if you do, that is enough. Number of shares to be sold is asked. Price is known, value is known. So number of shares can be found. Then this is one strategy. What is the other strategy? The number of Nifty contracts to be bought or sold. You can use index futures to hedge. Now, what do we know? Current value of equity portfolio, we know. Equity beta, we know. You want 0.91. So, reduction, what you want. So, how much you have to sow? Uh, see, in the portfolio, you have a long position. For hedging, you have to take the opposite position. So, you have to sell. What is the Nifty futures price? What is the contract size? So, what is the value of one contract? How many contracts to be sold? What do we know? We know if you sell 120 Nifty futures contract, then you would have been successful in bringing down the beta. Now, Nifty is rising 1%. Then we will see what happens. 1.3 is your beta. So if Nifty rises 1, this will rise 1.3. So after portfolio, uh, after the rise, the portfolio value will be this much. But this uh, value of uh, Nifty contracts, it's still like 25,000, like that. 120 contracts we have taken. So for that, how much you will settle? You have gone short. If you have gone short and the price goes up, you have a loss. So, value of portfolio, net of cash settlement. This 5065 you have as the value of the equity portfolio. 1950 you have settled because of mark to market, you have settled. So, Apart from this, or uh, considering this uh, cash settlement, what is the value? What is the increase. What is the change? What is it you wanted? You also wanted by name. So you have achieved what you wanted. Is this clear?
So this is what you wanted to achieve. You wanted to get 0.91, you got 0.91. If you are through with this, we can move on to the next one. So now let's move on to the next problem. So, a future contract is available on R Limited. It pays an annual dividend of 4. Shares is currently priced at 125. Given the above information, what should be the price of one future contract? Again, same story. You have to compound and find the future value. Each future contract calls for delivery of 1,000 shares in one year. They keep marking to market. Well, rate is given. Then, if the company's stock price decreases by 6%, what will be the price of one futures contract? Then, as a result of this price decrease, will an investor who has a long position will he realize a gain or loss? And of course, what will be the amount of gain or loss? You can try this. Lot size is 1000, current price is 125. So are you clear with the question? Given the above information, what should the price of one future contract be? Future lot size is there, current market price is there, annual dividend is there. What is the risk free rate? So, what is the fair future price? Now, after we have solved the problem, I'll give you some notes on the fair future price. Second requirement is if the company's stock price decreases by 6%, what will be the price of one future contract? So again, same story. Now, 
No future lock size is there. Current market price is there. Annual dividend is there. We have to look at considering all this, what should the price be? So once we have completed this, what happens? Is there a profit or a loss? Okay, now let me stop sharing this. And then maybe you would like to note down regarding fair price. Please note down. The underlying assets have the heading fair price of futures. Fair price of futures. The underlying assets. Spot price and futures price will differ. This is because the spot price is the present value of the asset, whereas the future price is the future value of the asset. Fair price of a future is the future value of spot price which is affected by which is affected by one interest rate two time to expiry three if we are talking about a stock, then we will get dividend during this time. If we are talking about a commodity, it becomes necessary for you to store it. So that also has to be considered. So three, dividend or storage cost. The fair value of futures is the theoretical price at which the futures contract should trade to reflect 
today's spot price to reflect today's spot cash price and the cost of carry cost of carry summarizes the factors that cause the difference between the spot price and the futures price the cost of carry represents the cost of holding the underlying asset the underlying asset over the life of the futures contract cost of carry percentage is equal to risk free rate plus storage cost plus storage cost minus dividend yield cost of carry is equal to risk free rate plus storage cost minus dividend yield so while calculating the fair value while calculating the fair value of future for a financial product fair value is equal to cash price plus interest cost minus dividend fair value for a commodity is equal to cash price plus interest cost plus storage cost cash price plus interest cost plus storage cost so you can try this problem try problem 10 this again is a nice problem
So now, what do we know in this problem? What is the overall profit or loss to Ram? Ram buys 10,000 shares of X Limited at a price of 22 per share. Beta is 1.5. He sells 5,000 shares of A Limited at a price of 40, having a beta value of 2. He obtains a complete hedge by Nifty Futures at 1,000 each. He closes out his position at the closing price of the next day. When the share of X Limited dropped by 2%, share of A Limited appreciated by 3%, and Nifty Futures dropped by 1.5%. What is the overall profit or loss to now? So what do we know now? Overall profit or loss to now. What happens? Now, X long position, number of shares, current market price. What is the value? What happens to the change next day? So what will be the next day price? Is that a profit or loss? Loss. A, say, hey, if you have a long position, if the price goes up, you gain. If you have a short position, if the price comes down, you gain. Now here, it so happens that he has a long position in X, but then the price uh, comes down. He has a short position in A, but then the price goes up opposite of what should have happened. So from the equity portfolio, 10,400 loss. He obtains a complete hedge by Nifty Futures. At 1000 each. So, what should be done for complete hedge? Here you have a long position, therefore, here you have to have a short position. Here you have a short position, therefore, here you need to have a long position. This is the value of the stock. Multiply with beta, it will tell you what is the value to be hedged. You have to go short by 3 lakh 30 and long by 4 lakh, which means net long by 70,000. So now you have gone you have gone 70 contracts long. You have gone long. If the price comes down, you lose. Therefore, what is the loss you have here? What is the total loss in the equity as well as in the futures?
Is this clear? There is a loss in the portfolio of 10,400. Why there is a loss in the equity portfolio? Because where we have gone long, the price has dropped, which means there is a loss. Where we have gone short, the price has gone up. Again, there is a loss. So 10,400 is a loss which you have in your portfolio. You took a complete hedge. Now it was going long in futures, 70 contracts, but then what happens? Here also, where you have gone long, the price has dropped, therefore there is a loss. Total loss is 11,450. Now you might wonder, hedging means you should bring down the loss. You should eliminate the loss. Why am I having a loss? You might wonder. Why are you having a loss? That is because the estimate of beta is wrong. The estimate of beta is wrong. That is why. What did you estimate? X, you said beta value is 1.5. That is the beta value you have assessed. Which means when the nifty changes, this should change 1.5 times. Then for the next one, you estimated beta to be 2. Therefore, if there is a change, this has to change twice. Both are positive betas. So, if 1.5% Nifty has changed, twice the 3%, this should change. It has changed 3%, but in the opposite direction. If there is a, if your estimate of beta for A is correct, you have estimated to be 2. If there is a drop of 1.5 in Nifty, there should be a drop of 3%. On the other hand, in A, there has been an increase in 3%. That is the reason why you have got a loss in both. If you look at the actuals, change in security divided by change in market is the beta. Your actual beta, if you see, is 1.33 and 2. If you had estimated this 1.33 and 2 correctly, this is just because of rounding off. Because you cannot take 693.333 contracts. You have rounded off to 693. Now you see, there is only a loss of 5 rupees. So the reason why you had a loss is because you did not estimate beta correctly. That has cost this loss you estimate beta with past now whatever beta you estimated with past that is not actually working you see actually when you look at the actual change if you had estimated the beta correctly, then you have done. You find that it is fine. Now let us move on <coughs> to the next problem. So now let us move on. 
to the next one. Required on September 15 is the December futures underpriced or overpriced. What arbitrage transaction is possible? Calculate the gain or loss. You can try this, then we can discuss. An index future is traded with rupee value being 100 per index point. So they are saying lot size is 100. On 15th September, the index closed at 1195 and December futures, last trading day, they are given to be December 15, was trading at 1225. The historical dividend yield on the index was 3% per annum. We have already seen how to adjust dividend. And borrowing rate was 9.3%. He said we have to adjust interest also. And assume 360 days. So, day count convention, they want you to take 360. How to go about doing this? Now, you know, spot price plus cost of carry will give you the uh, theoretical value. Theoretical value and actual price, if they are same, then there is no arbitrage opportunity. If there is a mispricing, you can have arbitrage opportunity. Now, index future lot size is there, close price is there. Borrowing rate is 9.5%, which we have to add. Dividend yield is 3%, which we have to deduct. So cost of carry will be 9.5% minus 3%, 6.5%. This is for 91 days. Therefore, uh, for 360, if it is 6.5%, how much is it for 91 days? So spot price plus the cash price plus the cost of carry you add. So you get the theoretical or fair price. Actual price is there. They are different. So, it is possible. You find that December index futures is overpriced and it should be 1214, it's 1225. So, when it is overpriced, we have to short. If it is underpriced, we have to go long. So, this answers the first question. Whether it is underpriced or overpriced. And second question. What is the possible gain? Next, calculate the gain and losses if index on 15 December closes as 1260 and 1175. Now, closing is on 15th December. First, on 15 September, it is 1195. Lot size is there. So you buy the stock with borrowed funds. You go long. 
borrowing rate is there? What is the interest on borrowings? You repay the loan along with interest. Dividend yield you would have received. You sold index futures. This is the position, starting position. Next, this is what happened in the beginning. Now they have given you two scenarios. Calculate gain and loss if index on 15th December closes at 1260, that is one scenario. 1175, that is the other scenario. So 1260 means what happens? It's 1260. You bought December index futures at exit price 1260. Loss in futures. So, what is the loss in futures contract? Because 100 is a lot size. And then cash market, whatever you had, you can sell now. You get the value. So, the gain due to arbitrage, the difference. Whatever amount you repaid, you have to adjust. Whatever dividend you received, you have to adjust. In the cash market, the amount realized you have got. Dividend you have got. The loss in futures, what you cashed that you have to deduct. And the repayment of loan you have to deduct. So the gain would be 1036.55. Now, the second scenario, 1175 in December, then what happens? You bought December index futures at exit price. Gain in futures is 50. So, for our lot size of 100, 5000. Cash market, whatever amount you have realized, then what is the gain? Again, adjust. Adjust for all that you have paid and received. Dividend received you got. Cash market you have got. But loan you have repaid. Again, there will be a cash settlement. Yeah. 
if you undertake arbitrage, you will only have a gain. You won't have a loss. If you are a speculator, you could have a gain or a loss. Okay, so now we'll have a break and then touch it.
So let us continue. <clears throat> And our derivatives, we saw based on the nature of the contract, you could have forwards, futures, options, swaps. Forwards, we will see along with forex. Futures, we already saw before the break. Now we will look at options. What is an option? An option is a special contract. What is the speciality? Any contract, both the parties will have the right, will have the obligation. An option is a special contract under which the option holder enjoys the right to buy or sell something without the obligation to do so. So, there are two types of options. An option to buy is a call option. An option to sell is a put option. We already saw, we will have certain jargons. We won't say the investor hedged using a future by buying the future. We would say he is going long on the Similarly, selling, we would say he will go short. Similarly, here also, if you see, you have two types of options. The option to buy is a call option. And an option to sell is a put option. The option holder is the buyer of the option. And the option writer is the seller of the option. The price of the option is the option premium. The option holder pays the option premium to the option writer upfront. That is, at the time of entering the option contract. The underlying price at which the option holder can buy or sell the underlying is called the exercise price or the strike price. The act of buying or selling the underlying asset as per the option contract is called exercising the option. The date on which the option expires or matures is known as expiration date or maturity date. We already saw derivative contracts are of predetermined fixed duration. After this date, it is useless. It is worthless. That is what we know. Now, what is it we have learned about options? An option is a special contract. What is the speciality? Option holder enjoys the right to buy or sell something without the obligation to do so. There are two types of option. Option to buy, option to sell. If you have the option to buy, it is called an option. If you have an option to sell, it is called a put option. The option holder is the buyer of the option. The option writer is the seller of the option. The price of the option is the option premium. The holder of the option pays the option premium to the writer up front in the beginning itself at the time of entering the option contract. The underlying price at which the option holder can buy or sell the underlying asset is called the exercise price or strike price. The act of buying or selling the underlying asset as per the option contract is called 
exercising the option. The date on which the option expires or matures, that is referred to as the maturity date or the expiration date. Now, again, based on the time of exercise, okay, so based on the nature, this can be classified as two things. One, call option. Two, put option. Option to buy is a call option. Option to sell is a put option. Now, based on the time at which you can exercise, options again can be split into two. European option and American option. European option and American option. What do you mean by a European option? A European option can be exercised only on the expiration date. On the other hand, an American option can be exercised on or before the expiration date. Based on trade, options traded on the exchange is known as exchange traded option, and options not traded on the exchange are called over the counter options. So now, classification we have seen based on the nature call option, put option, option to buy, call option, option to sell, put option. Based on the time at which it can be exercised, European option, American option. European option only on the expiration date. American option on or before the expiration date. Based on how it is traded, exchange traded, or OTC. Now, forwards are always OTC. Futures are always exchange traded. Options can be OTC or can be exchange traded. So, now, option price, the option premium. This option premium has two components to it, intrinsic value and time value. What is this intrinsic value, time value? First. Intrinsic value, another name, theoretical value. Intrinsic value is the first component of an options price. It is the value attached to an option for being able to buy or sell at the options exercise price which is beneficial as compared to the current price. It is the value of an option if the option were to be exercised immediately. So it is the difference between the option's exercise price and the stock's current price. Intrinsic value, who can I calculate? Now, call option is an option to buy. Then will I have an advantage of buying an option? Then will I have an advantage of exercising the call option? I will have the advantage of exercising the call option only if I can buy at a price lower than what it is available now. Therefore, what can I say? The intrinsic value is which one should be low? The exercise price should be low. Then only I intrinsic value for a call option. On the other hand, for a put option, I should be able to sell at a higher price. Therefore, the exercise price has to be more. Exercise price is the price at which the call option can be bought or sold. So, what do we know now? 
intrinsic value, also known as theoretical value. Intrinsic value is the first component of an options price. It is a value attached to an option for being able to buy or sell at the options exercise price. It should be beneficial as compared to the current price. It is a value of an option. If the option were to be exercised immediately, it is the difference between the option strike price and the stock's current price. So now, please note down intrinsic value is calculated as under call option maximum of S minus E or zero. Next put option maximum of E minus S or zero. Intrinsic value can never be negative. At expiration, the options value will only consist of intrinsic value. Now, the other component, we said the option value, the option price, which is the premium, consists of two components. One is the first component, which is intrinsic value or theoretical value. The next is extrinsic value or time value. So what is this? This is the second component of the options price. An options extrinsic value that portion of the options price that exceeds its intrinsic value. Time value of an option is the value of the option over and above the intrinsic value. Time value is equal to option premium minus intrinsic value. So if you have an option which has zero intrinsic value, then entirely it is made up of time value. The time value is the value associated with the possibility that an option can become valuable before it expires. Now, we also need to know what is known as moneyness of the option. What do you mean by moneyness of the option? There are three possibilities there. Whether the option is in the money, at the money, or out of the money. In the money means it has intrinsic value. At the money means no intrinsic value. In the money means if you are to exercise today, you will get value. At the money means your exercise price as well as stock price is same. Out of the money means if you exercise today, you won't get anything. It is the meaning. So, is this clear? If it's clear, we can take up a couple of problems and work it out.
Now, before we take up the problem, we need to know something called option pricing binomial model. Now, what is this binomial model? Binomial name itself tells you it's two state. So, what are two possibilities are there? A stock or any asset for that matter currently is selling at a particular price. After the period, what can happen? It can go up or come down from whatever we have as a price now. Binomial model is this kind of a model. So what should I do? First, I should find payoff. What have we seen? Upper price is there, lower price is there. Only two possibilities are there. I will find payoff for the upper price. So I will take maximum of U as E or zero. What is the meaning of U as? The upper stock price. That is a possibility. What is uh, E exercise price between the two, whether US minus E or zero, whichever is more, that is what I will take. We have already seen you can never have it as negative, but we will see. So, next, I'll have to find the payoff for the down price, that is, maximum of DS minus E or zero. DS is when the price falls, what is it? Yes, of course, is the uh, stock price. So, DS means the lower price minus E. E stands for exercise price or zero. So, I have to find after the period what the price is likely to be. Then, I have to ascertain the probability the upper price and down price. For this, we use what is called the risk neutral probability. So, this risk neutral probability can be found as the probability of rise will be capital R minus G divided by U minus D. Capital R is 1 plus risk free rate. D is DS by S0, that is down price as a rate of current price. U is upper price as a rate of current price. So, this we have the probability. Probability of rise, if you find, probability of fall will be 1 minus probability of rise. So, we will find the expected payoff. What is expected payoff? various outcomes. Here, of course, it's binomial. Only two outcomes are there. For which we have established the probability. For these two, we have the payoff. So, you will find what is the expected payoff. And then, this is future value. So, you will discount and find present value. That is the idea. Now let's take the problem as well. So now taking this uh, problem, the current market price of an equity share of pension is four twenty. So, stock price is 420. Within a period of three months, maximum and minimum price expected to be 500 and 400. Now, since only two possible things are given, we know one represents the upper price, the other represents the down price. Therefore, we are talking about a binomial model here. If the risk free rate of interest is 8%, so small r is 8%, what should be the value of a three months call option? Under this neutral method, at the strike rate of 450. So, exercise price is 450. You are given e to the power 0 0.02 is 1.0202. See, had it been annual compounding, 
here one compounded at two percent would be only one point zero two. Since this is continuous compounding, the value is more. The one will be one point zero two zero two. You try and then we can. We have to find what is the value of call option. So the formula for finding the probability is this. Then you have a binomial model. Probability of rise R minus T divided by U minus T and probability of fall. Probability of rise is R minus G divided by U minus G. Probability of fall is 1 minus probability of rise because it's binomial. You consider only two state. Only two state means the total probability is 2. And therefore, if you have the probability of rise, then the other probability of fall will be. 1 minus this. So now we can go to the problem. What we have to do is we have to find what is the payoff for the upper price, what is the payoff for the down price, multiply with the probability. We will get the expected payoff. That expected payoff is future value. We are trying to find what is the value or price of the option now. So discount and bring it to present value. That is what we will do.
So now, from the problem, we know that the current market price is 420. Exercise price is given to be 450. What is the upper price? 500. What is the down price? 400. So U, that is the upper price as a rate of the stock price we find. Again, down price is a rate of stock price we find. Annual risk free rate is given to be 8%. The period is. What is the period for the option? The period of the option is 3 months. Therefore, 3 by 12 or 1 by 4, 8% annual means. It is 2% for a quarter. Continuous compound factor I want, which is e to the power rt. e to the power rt is e to the power 0 0.02. It is given it is 1.0202. Probability of rise would be e to the power rt minus t divided by u minus t. When it is periodic compounding, we will have capital R, which is the compound factor. If it is continuous compounding, we should take e to the power rt. So we have found the probability of rise. Probability of fall will be 1 minus that. Is this part over? So once we have this, we can find the payoff of upper price. It's a call option. So payoff would be S minus E. Call option is an option to buy. In an option to buy, option to buy has value if you are able to buy it at a lower price. Therefore, it has to be S minus E. The exercise price is 450. US is 500, so 50. Maximum of US minus E or 0. Similarly, down price, maximum of DS minus E or 0. If this is over, we can move on to the next one. So now let us move on.
the next problem. Sumana wanted to buy shares of EIL a month later. It has a range of 411 to 592. Again, we know we are talking about binomial model because low price and high price given. Current market price is 421. Her broker informs that the price of this share can go beyond 522 within a month and that she should buy a one month call. In order to be prudent in buying the call, the share price should be more than or at least 522, the assurance of which could not be given by her broker. Though she understands the uncertainty of the market, she wants to know the probability of attaining the share price of 22. So the first requirement of the question is, you have to find the probability of the share attaining 592 so that buying of a one month call of EAL exercise price 522 is justified and vice versa. Take risk free rate to be 3.6%. And again, continuous compounding is to be used. That is why they have given e to the power 0 0.036 is 1.037. This is the compound factor. The first requirement is to find probability of risk. So we already discussed how to find the probability. So what do we have now? Current market price is there, excise price is there, upper price, down price. So we can find U and D. U is upper price as a rate of spot price and D is this down price as a rate of spot price. So risk free rate is there. E to the power T. Now, normally we would have assumed the rate given as an But if you look at the compound factor, they have given it for 0 0.03 switch. So we need to assume because the compound factor is given that way, we have taken this 3.6 to be for the period itself. Probability of rise will be e to the power rt minus d divided by u minus d. Is that clear? So once we have this, we can find the probability of fall. One minus probability of rise is probability of fall.
Now, once we have this, we have the upper price, we found the probability. So we can find, similarly, we can find the expected price. Exercise price. Now it's a call option. You want the exercise price to be lower than the expected price. That is not the case here. Therefore, call option is not the one. That is your conclusion. So next we can see a couple of problems on strategies. What do we mean by an option strategy? Option strategies allow the option holder to benefit from significant movement in a stock's price in either direction. See. If you expect the price to go up, you will buy a call option. If you expect the price to come down, you will buy a put option. If you think the price will change, but do not know whether it will go up or come down, then you have a strategy. Option strategies. You can have straddle strategy. There are many strategies, but as far as we are concerned, from the exam point of view, we can look at straddle, strangle, and we can also maybe look at variations of that as strip and strap, what it stands for. Now let us see what is a strategy. What is a strategy? A strategy is when you do not know whether the price will go up or come down, because if you expect the price to go up, you will necessarily buy a call option. If you expect the price to come down, you will buy a put option. You don't know, you know that it will change, but you do not know whether it will go up or come down, then you go for a strategy. Now, what strategy? That is, strategies involve buying a call option as well as a put option. So, first, let us look at Strangle strategy. Strangle strategy. What is the stock prices are expected to move significantly in either direction? Stock prices are expected to move significantly in either direction. So what you will do, what we are looking at now is triangle strategy. Buy an OTM call option. What is OTM? We saw three possible situations regarding moneyness. In the money, at the money, and out of money. Out of money means it will not have any intrinsic value. If it doesn't have any intrinsic value, premium will be less. Why premium will be less? Because option premium or option value is made up of two components, intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Now, when you look at intrinsic value, 
for out of money intrinsic value is not there if intrinsic value is not there obviously the option premium will be less so the idea behind going for out of the money option is that you want the option premium to be less so note down strangle strategy Stock prices are expected to move significantly in either direction. So, how would you construct such a strategy? Buy an OTM for the option. Buy TM put option. So now for both the call option and the put option, you are the holder. Therefore, you have to pay the premium. We discussed in detail regarding options. Now, both call option and put option, you are the holder means you have to pay the premium. So, net premium paid is equal to net premium paid is equal to call premium plus put premium. Now, we said both call and put we will be actually buying out of the money meaning no intrinsic value is there. For a call, there is no intrinsic value means it will be more than the stock price. Call option is an option to buy. So you will have intrinsic value only if the exercise price is less. Now, since it's out of the money, the exercise price will be more than the stock price. On the other hand, the put also you bought out of money. For a put, it will it'll be uh, out of money because it's a put option option to sell. It has worth only if you are able to sell at a higher price. If you say that also is out of money, it means that the put exercise price will be less. Therefore, when you construct a strangle strategy, call exercise price greater than put exercise price. Call exercise price greater than put exercise price. Then next we will take straddle. What do you mean by a straddle? Here again, stock prices are expected to move significantly in either direction. But you will buy an ATM call option. What is ATM call option at the money? Buy an ATM call option. Buy an ATM put option. So now both are ATM. Therefore, call exercise price is equal to put exercise price. Here again, you are the holder. Therefore, net premium paid is equal to call premium plus put premium Call premium plus put premium. So let us try this problem. Contract size is 100 shares. 
Mr. X established the following strategy on Delta Corporation stock. Purchased one month call option premium. Purchased one month put option premium is given. Call option 550 is the exercise price. Put option 450 is the exercise price. Delta Corporation stock is currently selling at 500. Now, this is a strangle strategy. How do we know? The problem has not mentioned it is a strangle strategy, but we know it is a strangle strategy. How? Because current stock price is 500. The call exercise price is 550. Call exercise price is more than the stock price means it is out of money. Put exercise price is less than stock price, means it is out of money. Both you have uh, done out of money, you have bought out of money. So, three possible scenarios are there. After three months, it remains at 500. After three months, it falls to 350. After three months, it rises to 600. So, what is your position? That is what you have to find out. Please tell me. Now, what do we find? The strategy is to buy a call at exercise price 550, buy a put at exercise price 450. The premium is given 30 and 5. In both, you are the holder. Therefore, the net premium paid would be the total of both. 35. Now, three possible scenarios were given. After three months, it remains at 500, drops to 350, rises to 600. Long call I have. Now, the exercise price is 550. For a call, only when the exercise price is less than the stock price, I will exercise. When in the market it is available at 500, I have the exercise price or the option to buy at 550. Will I exercise? No. So, what will be my payoff? Zero. Similarly, if it is 350, Stock price in the market itself, it is available at 350. Option, remember, is a special contract. I have no obligation. 
the floor. Will I exercise that? No, I won't exercise that also. If it is 600, will I exercise? Yes, I will exercise because I in the market it is at 600, but I have the option to buy it at 550. I can buy it at a lower price. Therefore, I will exercise and I'll get 50. Similarly, for put for each of this, when will I exercise a put? Only then the exercise price is greater than the stock price. What is the total value? First scenario, nothing. Second, I'm getting 100. Third, I'm getting 50. Premium paid is paid upfront. Therefore, that is a loss for me. What is the net? The contract size is 100. So these three situations, this is what we will get. The three situations you've been asked to find what is the profit or loss. Now, you will always find for the holder, for the holder, the maximum loss would be the premium paid. For the writer, the maximum gain will be the premium paid. You constructed the strategy considering that there will be wide movements, significant movements. So you will make the maximum loss when there is no movement. That is 500. That is why you have a loss of 3,500, which is the premium paid. So maximum loss is that only. What is the advantage of constructing the strategy? Let us see if there is wide movement, what will happen? Your profit will be substantial. Let us say for 500, which is the price now, it drops to zero. Then what will I have? I will have 41,500 profit. No, no, from 500 it becomes 5,000. Then my profit will be much more. Then 25,000 it moves, let us say. See, Chapter is going up, there is no limit. Coming down, the least it can come is zero. So, what we, this is not part of the solution. Just to explain the strategy, I'm showing it to you. See how it is profitable. The three cases which we have taken, 0, 5,000, 25,000, that is just for our understanding. That is not part of the solution. Well, let us take another problem, which will give us a very clear idea regarding holder, writer, put option, call option, different scenarios, what is the position? It will give us a 
very clear idea. Let us take that. Calculate the expiration date cash flow, meaning on the expiration date, how much is going to be the cash flow. Now, when we talk about settlement of an option, we have what is known as physical settlement and cash settlement. What is physical settlement? What is cash settlement? Now, maybe it might be better we note down this before we get into the problem. Now, what you will do, please note down. Option holder. The option holder has the right to exercise the option. He purchases, he purchases the right by paying a price. The price for paying, the price for purchasing the option That is the premium he is paid up front. Therefore, he has the right, but not the obligation. Option writer. The option writer has the obligation to fulfill the desire of the holder regarding. The exercise of the option. He sells the right by receiving a price. The price for selling the option that is the premium is received up front. Therefore, he has the obligation but not the right. Next, call option. A call option is an option to buy the underlying asset. The holder of the call option will exercise the option to buy the underlying asset. If the exercise price is less than the stock price, the writer is obligated, the writer is obligated to sell 
the underlying asset at the exercise price. Physical settlement. See, first we are looking at whether the option will be exercised. If the option is exercised, it can be physical settlement or care settlement. So physical settlement, what happens? We will see. Physical settlement. If the call is exercised, if the call is exercised, the option holder will pay the exercise price to the option writer. The option writer will deliver the underlying asset to the option holder. Cash settlement. If the cost option is exercised, the option writer will pay the option holder the payoff that is S1 minus E. No delivery of the underlying asset is made. No delivery of the underlying asset is made. Next, put option. A put option is an option to sell. A put option is an option to sell. The holder of the put option will exercise the option to sell the underlying asset if the exercise price is more than the stock price. The writer is obligated to buy the underlying asset at the exercise price. Physical settlement. If the put option is exercised, the option holder will receive the exercise price from the option writer and deliver the underlying asset. To the option writer. Cash settlement. If the put option is exercised, the option holder will receive the payoff. That is E minus S1 from the option writer. No delivery of the underlying asset is made. Now, why it is better you note down this is 
with regard to a call option. The holder has bought the option to buy the underlying asset. But with regard to a put option, the holder has bought the option to sell the underlying asset. So this difference will cause a lot of confusion. That is why it is better. We are clear. Cash settlement means whatever is the payoff, that only will be settled. Physical settlement means asset will be delivered and cash also will be given. So this distinction we should know. Now, this problem has all scenarios. Calculate the expiration date cash flow. So, expiration date cash flow means here we are assuming it is physical settlement and you will have the cash flow. Investment value. What do you mean by investment value? Investment value means payoff. Net profit. Net profit means payoff minus premium. For expiration date stock prices of 50, 55, 60, 65, 70 for the following scenarios. So we are going to look at it from the one who bought a call, who wrote a call who bought a put and wrote a put. Four different situations we are going to see. Now, exercise price is 60. Market price is 55. For a call, it is 9. And for a put, it is 1. The four situations we have to take. First, from the point of view of call option holder, what happens? So, first situation buy one call that is option holder. Current market price 55, exercise price 60, call option premium 9. Expiration date stock price. Different scenarios are there. 50, 55, 60, 65, 70. Now it is a call option. When will you exercise? Only when E is less than S1. What is E? 60. 60 less than 50? No. 60 less than 55? No. 60 less than 60? No. 60 less than 65? Yes. So only when the stock price happens to be 65 or 70, you will exercise. If you exercise, what's happening? If the holder exercise, he has to pay the price and receive the asset. So expiration date cash flow will be 60 in these two cases when it is exercised. Now, what is the payoff? Here, nothing. Here, 65, it is selling. You are able to get a 60, so 5 rupees. Similarly, here 10 rupees. Net profit will be payoff minus premium. You already paid the premium of 9. So, what will be the payoff?
there was a power failure. So sorry for that interruption. So this part, have you done? Now, this is from the point of view of the holder. Right is just the mirror image of this. If you have a loss of 9 here, writer will have a profit of 9. If you have a loss of 4 here, writer will have a profit of 4. If you have a profit of 1 here, writer will have a loss of 1. It is just the other effect. Now, once you have constructed this, for a holder, writer is very easy. So next, we are interested. This is where normally there is some confusion because as far as the put option is concerned, the holder has bought the option, but the option is to sell the underlying. So this sometimes causes some uh, confusion to students. But if you understand clearly that buying the option is different from, uh, you know, buying or selling the asset. Put option, you have bought the option, but it is to sell the underlying. Call option, you have bought the option, buy the underlying. So, since you are an option holder, when you exercise, you sell the asset and receive the money. When will you exercise the put option when E is greater than S1? Like we saw earlier, now each one of this is clear, isn't it? When you look at exercising the option, put to option means option to sell. You will exercise the option if the price at which you can sell, which is the exercise price, is more than the stock price. So that is why when the exercise price is 60, stock price is 50, you are exercising. Stock price is 55, you are exercising. Stock price is 60, at the money means we will decide that you are not exercising. 65 and 70, of course, you won't exercise. Because if you can sell the market itself at 65, why would you exercise the option and sell it at 60? That's what you want in that. Now, coming to the writer, 
it is just the mirror image of this. So if you have a profit of nine here, that will be a loss or four, loss again. There, the last three cases you had one 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 loss. Now you will have one 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 profit. So is this done? Then we can move on to the next question. Now let us look at the question. What is the expected share price three months hence? What is the value of call option at its expiration if the expected share price prevails at the end of three months? Determine the expected value of option at maturity, assuming that the call option is held to that time. Why does it differ from the option value determined in the previous request? What is the theoretical value of the option at the beginning of the three month period? Give comments on the market value in relation to theoretical value. An investor has purchased a three month call option on the equity share of a company for five. So, this is the premium, this is the price of the option. It has a present market price of 112, exercise price of 120. At the end of three months, investor expects the price of the share to be in the following range, 120 with varying probabilities. Expected value, expected price. The easiest thing to do is that various probable prices multiplied by the probability. That is what we will do. So what is the expected price? You have the various stock prices, you have the probability, multiply, add. So now the various prices are there, the probabilities we have. So price into probability at expected prices 129.5. Next. The share price at the end of three months, what is stated in the problem that if this expected price prevails. So 
<laughs> so the actual share price at the end of three months is 129.5. Excise price is 120. So the actual value of the option will be 9.5. This is the actual The next requirement, determine the expected value of option at maturity, assuming that the call option is held to this time. Why does it differ from the option value determined in one? So now you have to find expected value of the option. What we have here is the actual value. Expected value of the option means what is the probable price? What is the exercise price? Will you be exercising the option? Based on that, will you have an expected value? Multiply with the probability. You get 14. You find that this is different from whatever value we got earlier, 9.5. That is because this is the actual value after three months when you know what is the price, whereas this is the expected value when you do not know what the price is. So now, coming to the reason, the value of a call option at its expiration is found at the time of expiration. So we compare the exercise price and the prevailing stock price at the time of maturity. It is the actual value of the call option on expiration date. The expected value of the call option is computed now by considering all probable values and their associated probabilities. The various probable values of the call option are computed by considering the various probable share prices. The value of the call option for any probable price at or below the exercise price will be zero as there cannot be 
negative payoff. So now, there is just one more concept which we need to do before we close the class today. And that is regarding break-even. What do we mean by a break-even price? A break-even price is the, you do not, the usual concept of break-even, you do not have either the profit or a loss. That is break-even. The break-even price for a call option holder is equal to the break-even price for a call option holder is equal to exercise price plus premium the break even price for a put option holder will be exercise price Minus premium. So you might be asked to find break even. And we already discussed the concept of moneyness of the option, where you have three at the money, in the money, and out of the money. So that brings us to the end of today's session. Tomorrow we will be doing forecasts. So let me end the session.